When I'm working with a young tree, I want to keep that ground around that tree open for the first four, five, six years. I mean, this gets into what rootstock you're growing and some differences there. But, but, but basically, in those early years, I'm growing wood structure and I don't want to overcompete. And I might mulch completely such a tree because I'm really focused on keeping things more open. But once I get into the bearing years, um, I would never have enough ramial wood chips to completely mulch a tree. I also don't think it's a good idea because the forest edge is not completely mulched. Things are different. So diversity applies here as well. And I do what I call haphazard mulching in that whether you've got a wheelbarrow load or you've got a truck tractor bucket load, I'll kind of in my mind say, I'm working the south side of the tree this year or the east, and I'm not that literal either about that. But that way, there's woodsy mulch in different stages of decomposition. So I have one-year-old and two-year-old, three-year-old. That's part of the biology. You know, that's like a salad bar. And something's really rich here, that's what it wants. Something's a little different here. And over the course of time, I'm going to talk about some of these different plant allies. By year two or three, it's really easy to plant into those spots. So when I mulch out in the bearing orchard, my approach is more of what I call a meadow ecosystem. And I'm going to manage that where other people want to keep it more open or they're planting in the garden context. And we can talk about permaculture guilds and how that fits in. But when I mulch out there, um, I'm also not doing it in a permanent sense. This is fungal food. So for a year or two, I have good suppression and, and a lot more room for feeder roots to access the humus, the top inches of the soil. Um, but eventually things pop up through that. I'm not concerned about it. It's a, it's a different, you're not thinking like a garden mulcher or a landscape mulcher. This is just fungal food that you're applying out there. So we all have different resources that we can use. Could I ask you a question about that? Yes. That statement? Uh, I'm wondering about water and, and the value of, of water and how you relate the haphazard mulch to uh, the fact that the tree is benefits from having enough water. You're asking like a California question. <laughs> <laughs> you have to always adjust this for the conditions you have at your, your place. So my New England ecosystem feels a lot like what's happening here today. And water does not strike me as big of a concern. I mean, it's, a, it's very important, but I'm not, have, I'm growing full-size trees or MM111 rootstock mostly. So a bigger tree is a bigger reach in terms of nutrients and water. When you're growing more dwarf trees, these dynamics can shift. And, and that, that, again, is to stand up here and try to teach you all this, and then there's all these pieces. <laughs> and what pieces match what you're doing? You know, I'm hopefully going to kindle how to think about things. But yeah, it shifts. Um, my friend Dave Ulmer out in Sebastopol, he has pretty much the orchard completely mulched with wood chips and there's drip irrigation. But without that, he couldn't grow his trees. So y yeah, you have to adjust this. It's not going to be the same everywhere. So, you know, we all have different resources. I mean, you mentioned bamboo. I don't have bamboo. Maybe that's coming, but we don't have it yet. <laughs> um, one of the things I get sometimes are mulch hay, bales of mulch hay, because a farm friend loses their hay to the rain. So I just want to go through this little vig vignette of, of how I deal with mulch hay. I bring it back to the farm, and I just throw it here and there underneath the trees. And I don't break it apart, because that fall, I'm hoping field mice will nest in the mulch hay. Field mice are not voles. Field mice don't chew on the bark of the tree. And whether I'm a fan of field mice or not, I'm not going to say. But what I know is when that field mouse nest gets abandoned, next spring, one of the really joyful sounds of spring, and you're out there finishing your pruning and spreading wood chips, is you hear that low buzz. And that's the bumble queens awakening from their hibernating. And they're going to find a nest site to start this year's small hide and, and the brood. And the bumblebee is a species who that first hatching of brood is in sync with the apple bloom. Mm -hmm. So the more bumblebees that I can have, the more native pollinators in that section of, of the different types of bees I'm going to have in my ecosystem. 
bumblebee queen's favorite hive location is an abandoned field mouse nest. So I'll, I'm setting that up for the bumblebee. All summer long, bumblebees do their thing. By fall, the queens, the newly mated queens, go to hibernate in the ground, and the rest of the bees are not going to overwinter. That's the bumblebee cycle. And then, after I picked apples, I break those mulch hay bales apart, great source of potassium, and again, it's kind of like a pile. You know, it's, it's pretty much broken down at that point. But another thing I do is Sometimes I work as a carpenter for other people, sometimes for my wife. She wishes there was a little bit more of the other. Um, and when you sheetrock, um, you cut out for windows, cut out for doors. And sheetrock is calcium sulfate, which is gypsum. And sheetrock is gypsum pressed between two pieces of paper, which is treated with less than 1% boric acid as a fire retardant. Now, have to introduce the concept of American, Canadian sheetrock and Chinese sheetrock here. But if I know it's from a clean source, um, I use those scraps, throw them underneath the tree, usually throw the mulch hay over it. Now you wouldn't go out to Lowe's or Home Depot or your lumber yard after this talk and buy 20 sheets of sheetrock and lay it out like a carpet. But that's part of my resource and gypsum adds calcium. Mm. Sulfur has a big role in the soil as well. And I just create, again, a salad bar pocket because I have these scraps. Chinese sheetrock, um, if you don't know. <laughs> they installed it in condominiums in Florida, and a year later, the electrical wire system had corroded away. I have no idea what the Chinese put into sheetrock. <laughs> and, and similarly here, th I don't know why I'm talking about sheetrock. We shouldn't be doing this. That's our world. You can get the green paper sheetrock, which is treated with a chemical to be... I don't use that. I mean, I know the difference. So just, just to be aware of it. But again, it's about resources. We do a lot of things with medicinal herbs, and we dry them in our solar drying tunnel. And when I go to a clear cut where they've done a logging job, a couple of years later, there's all kinds of raspberries growing there. And so I will literally harvest truckloads, pick up truckloads of first-year raspberry canes, which after one day in the drying tunnel, we strip off the leaves. It's a great women's tea herb. I have all these raspberry canes. They go out into my stem. So you, you'll start to recognize, I could do this, I could do this. This would work to build that forest edge ecology. And just think about the forest edge. Um, and we'll get talking about taproot plants as well, and also decomposing leaves in place. But the point is, there's different ways to go about this.